good to be with each of you tonight. So honored to have just the privilege to just uncrack the word a little bit. You know, these moments, I don't know about you, but I felt greatly encouraged in the worship tonight. It was like water to my soul. Right? And that's, that's just such a beautiful thing, to be able to come in and be with other people um, that are going after the same heart, which is the Lord himself, and then have in these moments that richness of encouragement come and just uplift us when we need it, right? We've all had weeks, you know, a week where all kinds of dynamics were going on in each of our lives. I could tell you some of my story. It was a very interesting week, and just to be able to come in here in a safe place and be able to just just be encouraged by the Lord. It was just such a beautiful opportunity for that. And now what I want to do is I just want to take a minute, as we're in this Seat at the Table series, we're moving through it up to Easter, and I want to just um, encourage you um, in the objective of why we've been teaching on what we've been teaching, and it's this. It's to see every harbor partner activated in their calling to love people. You know, so often we, we go, man, what's my calling in life? Like, God, what do you have for me? There may be a specific way he's going to position you and a specific place he's going to position you in, but all of our callings are the same, to know God and to love people in the same way that he's loved us. Just that simple. And so I want to just continue along these lines um, and just by giving you a focus verse for you just to take and maybe meditate on this week. This is not what I'm teaching on tonight, but I want to put it up here for you so that you can see that this is Bible, okay? That there's significance in us all walking out our calling because as we do it collectively, there's a fruit that we can only accomplish together. Everybody say together. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. Look what it says. For his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together And constantly connected as one. We are unified in the Lord. Whether we realize that or not. In the spirit we are one. And he says this is what God has done. This is what he has accomplished through what Jesus did on the cross. As Juan was praying today. And he says this. And every member or every partner has been given divine gifts to contribute to the whole Isn't that amazing to think about? Like every single life has been given a gift from heaven. You know what that means? That means you carry significance. You are valuable. In fact, if we don't have you activated in your calling to love people, we are missing out. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? So this is God's objective in this moment is to see every partner in his kingdom, activated in their calling to love. It says that we are built up in this place and made perfect in love with one another. You know, we've been in this kind of Hebrews flow a little bit, chapter 12, verse 1, I've been talking about that we've been called to run. It's a season to run, not to sit. Amen? Amen. It's a season to run. We've been called to run. This is what he is up to. And he says that we're called to not only run, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, but to run with perseverance. Remember last week I talked about what does that word perseverance mean? It means cheerful endurance. We can run with a smile on our face, okay? Which is awesome. You know, there's joy in following God. Come on, somebody. All right? And so this is the beauty that we've been entrusted, to run this race with cheerful endurance. The writer of Hebrews, he says that it's perseverance because, guess what, this race isn't a sprint, it is a marathon. Ooh. And you know what, really, honestly, depending on how long we live in our lives and the seasons that God has for us, it probably isn't just one race of a marathon. It's probably many. And we complete race as well, right? And we, in the end, we complete the entire race well. And that's where God, we stand before him and he says, well done, good and faithful servant in the race that you have run. Did you know a marathon is 40 
thousand steps. And when you're running, your body weight pushes down on all of your joints. Every part of your body is affected as you're running. It's actually a little easier to walk a marathon. Come on, somebody. I think we should walk marathons, right? Um, but it's 40,000 steps. And here's what I want to ask. I want to do this. I want to ask three specific questions tonight for each person in this room. As we are all running this marathon race, no matter what number that race is, if it's your first, if it's your second, if it's your tenth, and here are the questions. Where are you in this race? you got to know where you are in the marathon. Number two, where are you going? Where do you want to go and why? This is very important. And then thirdly, which is massive, who are you running with? Who are you running with? So we're going to answer these three questions. A couple of weeks ago, I felt, for whatever reason, to go and give blood. I've never done that, ever. <laughs> Isn't that strange? God's like, go give some blood. What? <laughs> I'm wearing this shirt tonight because this was one of the things that I got. Besides a $20 gift certificate to Outback. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Didn't even know that was coming. I'm like, thank you, Lord. But I got this One Blood t-shirt. And it says under One Blood, this is awesome, even, even blood donation centers are agreeing with the gospel. It says, share your power. They're recognizing that there's power in the blood. Think about it. For us sitting in this room that know the Lord, we have been transformed by the gospel, by the one who shed his blood on behalf of all of our lives. And so we carry power in our being. Did you know that? And we are to share the power, if you will. This is where everybody is journeying together on this marathon race. And we each need to know where are we, where are we going and why, and who are we running with in this time. Super important. So let's just look at this question, where are you? Here's what I want to just say. This is going to sound like oversimple, but I think that it's, it's so important for, for us to be able to grasp tonight. If you want to know where you are, you're going to have to be honest. And you're especially going to have to be honest with yourself. You know, like even when, when Adam was, was running his little race and then he got a little detoured, he's hiding out behind this bush, you know, God is asking him the question, Adam, where are you? How many of you know God knew exactly where Adam was? Okay, God knows where we are in the race. He knows exactly where we are. But he wants us to know where we are. But we're going to have to get honest. The other week I was able to just kind of practically... Um, kind of walk in this myself, because by the way, let me, little secret, little, little caveat for you, whatever I preach on up here, I have to live. <laughs> if you, if, like I thought you could just, when I went to Bible school, I thought you just learn a like a Bible thing and then you preach it, but you don't really have to live that, you know what I mean? Like you just, you're just telling everybody else what to do, right? <laughs> But, but it's, 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 it's a unique thing that God is actually holding us to the very word that is becoming revelation to us. And so I was walking through just some stuff in my heart, and I told Wendy, I said, I just want to sit with this for a little bit and feel it. Why? Because I want to know where I'm at. If we just keep going, we miss a moment to come to an understanding on where we are in this race. We're called to run, but we need to know where we're at in the marathon. So guess what I started doing? And I, this is, I don't know why I did this, but I just was like, okay, what are the different phases of a marathon race? Did you know phase one is the adrenaline phase? Okay, phase one is the adrenaline phase. What's really interesting about this is that 
you know, usually with marathons, because they, they actually start at like 5.30 in the morning, and I've never ran a marathon, so I can't speak to this with any authority, but I can imagine if I was running a marathon, I'd be kind of like juiced up like all night, like this thing's coming, what's it going to be like, and probably not get much sleep the night before. If you go to a major marathon, like the Miami Marathon, right, there's thousands of other runners, and unless you're really good, guess where you're going to be back when it com- in, in the starting line when it comes to you, your part of the race? All the way in the back. So it starts at 5.30, but you might not get to the starting line until 6.30 a.m. But the whole time you're like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, you're like, there's adrenaline. And then when, when you cross over, boom, the gun goes off for you. Guess what? I can just, this is going to be me for sure. I'm going to start at a sprinter's pace, just, man, you know, just cruising, sub four-minute mile, like I'm, I'm going after, why? Because juice is flowing in me, right? And this is the adrenaline phase. You're so stoked. But then guess what? The next phase hits. Once you get past all the crowds and everybody, your wife, go, Darren, go, ah! Yeah. It's called the reality check. Look this up. This is true stuff. The adrenaline phase, and then all of a sudden you're running. There's no one around you. In fact, everybody is out distance you. You're just kind of running alone, and then the reality check hits in. You ever had one of those moments in life? The reality check? By the way, before I continue any further, are these 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 things that I'm talking about today, there's not, they're not just a one-off. You're not just going to have adrenaline moments. You're not just going to have a reality check moment once in your life. These things are cyclical. They're going to kind of come around. You've got to see the patterns of life. You've got to know the next time you get in the race, oh, I've been here before. And last time I didn't handle it so well. This time I'm going to walk with a little more wisdom. Come on, somebody. I mean, you know we're in this race, and he's taking us through races, and, and as we go through them, we're growing We're maturing. Our capacity is getting greater in the Lord, right? From glory to glory. So in the reality check, you're kind of going, what have I got myself into here? Why did I sign up for a marathon race? (laughs) This is insanity. For those who enjoy marathons, y'all are crazy, okay? Crazy people. Even these 5K races, you know what I mean? Like I was like telling, we've been saying we're going to do a 5K for like 20 years. I've never done a 5K. I want to do what's called the diaper dash. Have you seen the diaper dashes? They're like a 100-yard sprint. That's it. But guess what? The Lord is growing us. What have I gotten myself into and if you're not careful, this part of the race can become very disorienting. And this is where you need to move to the next question. Okay? I'm trying to help you tonight because this is going to come at your life. You're going to get super stoked about something. God's going to, Jehovah Sneaky's going to lead you into a marathon sign up. Come on, somebody. He's going to put a number on you, right? And he's going to tell you to run. You're going to be all fired up. You're going to be stoked. You're going to be moving forward. And all of a sudden, reality check's going to come. You could be a little disoriented, you know, like maybe I'll just drop out. Maybe is there a way to get from here to the finish line without actually running the course? But here's what you need to answer. Where do I want to go? Am I feeling I'm supposed to go and Why? This is where after you get honest with how you're really feeling, you have to go back and remind yourself why I got in this race in the first place. What is the heart connect that I have to loving other people? Because everybody's going to do it differently. Everybody is going to be having different assignments in this calling to impact the world by loving people. By the way, outside of these four walls, most most of the time, there's a group that God will raise up within this house to love on you so that we can have a night like tonight, right? That's legitimate. 
but most of us are going to love people outside of these four walls, and we have to know what is our heart connect to this mission. So what I did, just to give you a little something maybe you should explore for yourself, is I wrote down the Davis family values of why we're in this race. This is why I run, okay? I'm gonna tell you my reasoning behind why I'm running this race, and even when I get disoriented, I have to pull back and go, this is the why behind my what here. And the first one is home. Home. This is where, man, I want to model transformation in my own family. I want to walk in authenticity. In other words, I'm not in this for the other stuff first. I'm in this for that first. I was telling a couple today that we were counseling as they're getting ready to get married in eight days. I was like, you know, if you look around like at the body of Christ, man, we got a lot of talented people, lots of gifted people in the ministry. But when they, their lives crumble because it isn't about home first, it brings tremendous disorientation to the rest of the body that's trying to run this same thing, thing called the race of God. It has to be fleshed out in our families. You know, I remember as God started to you know, take me on this journey, and I, I, at, at times when I hit the the you know, disorientation phase as, as, man, it was the reality check, if you will. The Lord always kept telling me, like, come back to what this is all about. Manifest your love for other people with your closest neighbor, and that's your bride named Wendy. Start there. Start there. That is number one value for me in the Davis home. So when I talk to my son, my, my kids, my son-in-law, my daughter, I'm like, we have to make this about family first. The second one is serving others. I want to live the rest of my life by adding value to other people. And I remember when I woke to that reality I was on the foreign field of the nations. I saw God moving among people, and I was like, my goodness, Lord, I want to give my life. I want to give my life. As my family is healthy, as God, you are moving and bringing revival into my home. Out as an overflow of that, I want to serve others. I want to give value to every single person that I meet. I had this one encounter so strong one time and when I was in Bible school in Texas that I literally fell on my knees. And consciously, I wasn't even intending to say this, I cried out, Lord, I'll put as many people into their purpose, calling, and destiny as I can. If you back me up, I will give everything for that purpose. Because this is not just a life for me. We can't be living our lives just for ourselves. If we don't have a passion, I believe, to give our lives to other people, to serve other people, to add value to other people, we're missing a massive aspect of what this race is all about. We're not just running it for ourselves. There's people that are longing to see someone model what longevity can look like to run a race and finish it well and run another race and finish it well and at the end of the day, run a life and finish it well and stand before God and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, by the grace of the Lord. Come on, somebody. The other thing, the third one is, I just have four here, is a biblical worldview. Here's my thing. I want to be aligned with what Holy Spirit is doing across the globe in this generation. Okay, I, I'm no with no apologies. I'm not just myopic. Like, okay, what's just going on in in my little town or my little uh, region or my my nation? Even God is up to something on a global scale, and I want to be in tune to what He's doing globally. And what season we're in is a generation in human history, and I want to be aligned with that reality. 
It's important because we're playing a part here in South Florida, which, by the way, is a significant piece of land, if you will, in this thing called the kingdom of heaven. Oh, come on, y'all. I remember when I moved down here, I was like, Lord, if you don't move here outside of, you know, we think, oh, we'll have, bring all this money in the church, that'll change South Florida. Or we'll get all these big, great programs, and we're going to really change the region. If we just have the best worship, that'll do it. No. The grace of God is the only thing that can change South Florida. 100%. The church has been brought to her knees in South Florida, and goodly, in a good way so. How would, you, how would it feel if we're like, the Lord says, listen, man, you've got all of this stuff, and you're blind, you're naked, you're, you think you're increased with goods, you're poor. God wants to give us a perspective, and also, too, in this, I want to know what did the previous generations contribute to getting us to this moment? And what does our moment set up and contribute for the next generation that's coming after us? we got to live multi-generational. Okay, yes, is Jesus coming back? For sure he is. But what if he doesn't come back before you take your last breath? Are you going to have on your mindset that, hey, I'm not just living for myself now. In fact, I'm not even just living for this generation. I'm going to plant trees that are going to grow, that are going to provide shade for people that I may never sit under. And that's okay. We are living in a biblical worldview. And the last one for me, and there's many more to this, but these are my four that I just want to share. Like when I go, man, why am I connected to this thing? Why do I burn for this? The last one is excellence. Here's what I mean by that. I want to take whatever God has placed in my hands and use it to the maximum capacity with the most beauty and excellence that I can be responsible for to see what he's entrusted to me to steward to begin to flourish. This is, why do I say that? This is where like, this may sound whatever, but I just, this is how I walk that out. Like if I'm walking around here and I see a little piece of paper on the floor, guess what? I'm going to lean over. I'm going to grab that little piece of paper. I'll put it in my pocket initially. If I can remember, because I'm getting older, right? Then I'll take it out of my pocket and put it in a trash can. I believe like everything we've call, been called to design, whether it's our home. My car that you drive in with me, this facility, like I want to create an atmosphere with the it, things that he's, I mean, our, when he could tell you, when we first met, I had, I, I had a guy back into me in Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina. I remember his name. I'll never forget it. He was from West Virginia, Big Creek, West Virginia. This is how, how impactful this moment was for me. Uh, he was from Big, Weech, Big Creek, West Virginia. His name was Dyke Dingle. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Dyke Dingle, I looked, I got a hold of his license, his license place, and figured, he backed into me, he must have been intoxicated, he totaled the Honda Accord that I spent all summer working for, and then as I'm sitting there, because I hit my head off the windshield, broke the windshield, I'm like looking at, this. he was driving one of those old uh, station wagons that are like, they were, it was from like the 70s, they're like a tank, okay, smashed me to smithering, and then he took off, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wait a minute, he's leaving the scene. I get out of my car and I'm running after Dyke Dingle. <laughs> stop, Dyke, stop. Well, he fled the scene. Dyke is still at large to this day. Come on, somebody. Okay, still at large. And I didn't get any insurance money because they never pursued Dyke because he was from Big Creek. You know, he was out of, from out of state. They didn't want to waste their time on this little case. I lost this vehicle. I went months. Have you ever gone without a car for a season? What's wrong with y'all? <laughs> really? I thought it was just me. Anyhow, it was a long time. When you don't have a car and you get a car, or have you ever been with you get an old car and then you get kind of a newer car? <laughs> it was like one of those. My dad helped me get into, what was it, a Buick? 
Skylark? <laughs> it was nice to me, okay? It was nice to me. I kept that thing so clean. Like it was, like I would just, I was so thankful for what God had given me. It was the shiniest, cleanest Buick Skylark probably in the nation. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it was heaven on earth. Because I want to steward with excellence everything that the Lord has given. Listen, here's the thing. Like, even tonight, I'm sitting in here, and I'm like, whoa. I was astonished by what I was feeling and experiencing in this room. I'm like, I don't want to take one moment of this for granted. I told Juan the other day, I lived 20 years for the most part, pastoring this church and never satisfied with what I was believing God for because I wasn't appreciating Sitting with it, thanking him for, whoa. And now I look back and I'm like, you did this and this. And wow, that was amazing. Now I just want to take it all in. Knowing where you want to go and why, what it does is it settles you into the race. We're wrapping this up. And it gets you to focus on the realities that are set before you. How many of you know we need to be focused? We don't need to be all over the board. So when you know, okay, this is why I've been called. You got to get into the heart. You got to sit with what you're feeling. You got to go there. You got to go, God, what moves me that may not move anybody else? If you're looking to be like somebody else, you're missing your course, okay? He wants you to find the why behind your why. What is it that moves your heart? And just be, just be obedient to love people in that way, okay? And if every one of us do what we're supposed to do, we get through the disorienting moment, we go back to that why, we lock back in again, then we have focus to run the race and navigate the realities that are set before us. Do you know marathon runners, they need to monitor, I'm, I'm giving you stuff from the marathon, but take this into your heart as you, as you walk this out spiritually. This is very practical. They need to run, they need to monitor what they call their running economy. Their running economy. I had a really interesting day yesterday. A guy I've been mentoring for almost 20 years, he runs a, a jet center. I get a call from him. I was like, oh my gosh, I could tell in his voice like something was so off. I thought his wife had died or something. It was like that, serious. I was like, what's going on? He said, Darren, one of our planes just crashed and we lost two of our pilots. Never had happened to their company in 30 years. He said, I need you, man. We got to go over to one of the wives' house and tell her her husband's not coming home. This guy's running a race in a space that not very many people run in, but he's loving people in that space. So we went and did this. It was very difficult. This was just last night. And on the way back, I felt to turn to him and the owner of the company, and I said, listen, you guys need to make sure that you're doing okay through this because it's going to be a little bit of a stretch here that you're going to have to walk through some stuff. You need to make sure that your hearts are okay as well because when we hit a moment we got to be careful that our economy of how we're running is, is properly poised so that we don't max out and not walk out a healthy work-life balance. Come on, somebody. We need to know, like, I am going to navigate this with wisdom so that I don't get myself in trouble. This is really important. Our muscles, listen, as we do this, as we learn to adapt and get like a, more of a, a healthy running economy and we're like, okay, I, can, I know how, much to, how hard to push it right now. I know when to pull back. Um, the muscles become, for marathon runners, did you know this? Fatigue resistant. Fatigue resistant. Come on. How many of you in the room would like to become at some point fatigue resistant? No matter what the enemy throws at you, 
No matter what he tries to put in your way, you are going to run. You're not going to maybe sprint like you know. You're going to you're going to take it with wisdom, and you're going to build this capacity, and you're going to become fatigue resistant. And he's going to get so exhausted himself trying to exhaust you. He's just going to give up. The other thing we have to have is we must have a high intake engine. What they call Wendy would know this a VO2 max. What's your VO2 max? They have the, these these things now that they put on elite athletes' faces. They're like a mask, and they run. And they measure how much oxygen you take in and how well it's transporting to your muscles that you're utilizing. Man, we should be breathing in Holy Spirit like never before in human history. (sighs) Fueling our muscles... And then it says, when you're strong, guess what you can do? You can overflow and encourage somebody. Get up and run. Let's go. Breathe in Jesus. I'm telling you, church as normal is out the window right now I, for me. It's, I, I'm feeling personally a drawing to the Lord and the Lord himself. That's really it. If I can get in that space, man, anything that God's called us to do, we can accomplish. We have to breathe God in, in that sense. We have to run as we're running and, and navigate how, how fast we're running through certain situations. But we need to increase that intake of the love of God into our own hearts. Don't let anything steal that from you. Last thing is Keniel comes up and then. Here's the thing, though, okay, because I'm trying to, like, help you in the race tonight. I wish I could take this away from you, but I can't. At some point in every race, you're going to hit the wall. That's the next phase. Okay? It's just inevitable because the amount you're outputting, there's not enough hydration in fact, it's interesting. I looked, I studied this. You, you could be drinking, 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 and at the, you're expending so much energy at the end of the race, you, no matter how much water you take in, you're never going to be able to replenish. The same with carbohydrates. Anybody in here like carbs? <laughs> this is your chance, guys. You got to carb up. You know? I'm going to go straight for the sweets. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Cupcakes in the marathon. Hand them to me. No, it's good carbs. What are the good carbs, Wendy? I don't know. Banana, pasta. Something that can get the fuel burning quickly. This is where you got to learn, like, what do I need to eat right now that's going to get the fuel burning quickly again? Are you, are you hearing me? We, we're not, we're going to hit the wall, but we're not going to get stuck there or drop out of the race. When we hit the wall and God's grace keeps us going, that's when the angels go, whoa, look at this. Look at the frailty of man and power of God being perfected in the weakness of human beings. Whoa. That's what they're saying. They're looking on, blown away at the gospel. Eat what brings fuel to you. Find what, do whatever you've got to do to go have a taste of that thing to get through this moment. Drink whatever you need to drink to get hydrated again in the Lord. Don't wait. Have you ever watched these marathon races? I was going to illustrate this tonight, but I, have you ever watched this, like, where they're running, you know, and they got all these people that are lined up, and they take the cup, and they drink it, and then they go, and they just keep running. Have you ever seen that? I want to do, I want to run a marathon just to do that, just to drink it and smash the cup. I don't know why. They don't just, like, and then let it, they just take the, I was like, that's so awesome. That almost motivates me to sign up for a marathon. So I can spike the cup. Come on. I would just drink water even if I wasn't thirsty just to throw the cup down. Come on, somebody.
But when you're low on fuel, you need to hydrate. You need to carb up. You better know who am I running with. Community. That's not a cliche word. When you hit the wall, you better know who do I have in my corner right now? Because when I looked at my friend and I said, hey, how are you doing yesterday? You need to, I'm with you. In fact, I said, I'll come stand with you. I'll do whatever you need me to do. I got you. We've been running together for a little bit. Those people handing out the waters and the carbs, they're essential to our race. Who's going to come along your, your side when you need it? Say, hey, take this, drink this, I got you. No carbs, no energy in the blood transferring to the muscles, you're going to be weak. No hydration, the blood volume in your body decreases, makes the heart work harder. Have you ever felt heart sick? Trying to, trying to pump my heart in this moment, I just don't have the strength. If you don't get help in that moment, you're going to have a heat stroke. Heat stroke affects the brain, what you're believing now. You're going to buy into all kinds of ungodly belief systems. Your heart is going to grow cold. You ever heard that one before? There'll come a day when the love of many will grow cold because they're not connected. Back to Ephesians 4, 16 as we close. For his body, you and me, have been formed in the image of God. When they created us, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man and woman in our likeness. He has created us for a unique assignment and then he has joined us together. And he's constantly connecting us together as one. Thus, why we named the One Initiative what it is. This is not some ploy. This is God, make us one. And to every member, I speak over your heart tonight. You've been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. Would you rise up in this moment for my sake? May I rise up in this moment for your sake? May we all be aware of the time and the hour that we're in and say this is a moment that God wants to move through his body, maybe like no other. Maybe without all the fancy stages and lights, camera, action. What if it was about a people that just love Jesus and then begin to love other people in whatever practical way he's called us to do? We need to champion each other on. Hey, wow, that's awesome what you're doing. Go, go, run. That's amazing. Keep going for it. If someone's a little down, you've hit the wall. Come on, man, you can get out of this season. You can get back on course. It's not too late. These gifts operate, I love this word, effectively through the whole body. And when this happens, we are built up and made perfect in love. Spirit of life, of the living God, We sense tangible touch and taste of your beauty here tonight. Would we take in your breath that's available? Would we eat 
of your fuel to strengthen us in this moment. Kenyo, could you just lead us for just a minute here? Just yes, God. Bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding. More lips. You made the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, silence me. Come on, there's power in His name. I want to do just as we close there's circumstances in this room that God knows he is shaking the darkness he is awakening you everybody has their own story everybody's walked through things everybody will walk through things but God is with you I need you to know this I need you to understand God is with you he promises he would never leave you or forsake you I feel the enemy's voice being shut down right now, accusing God to your mind for what has happened. Let that be shut down right now in this room in the name of the Lord, where you are emboldened again to trust God in his goodness. 
where nothing is going to steal from your calling to be a unique representative of the love of the Father in the earth in the way that he wants you to do that. All religion out of the room. All performance out of this place. All striving, leaving, where you find rest in God again. Where you take yourself out of the equation and you let God take over and take you to where he's calling you to go. If that's you, would you lift up your hand all over this room? Father, would you come tonight? Would you minister grace? There's a window here. Would you come and would you touch a heart, touch hearts in this place, Lord, to take them to where you're calling them to go and to be? We love you, Lord. We're just going to let the team hang here for a little bit. You'll be officially dismissed, but if you want to just kind of sit for a minute and just maybe go there in your heart, maybe God wants you to feel something tonight that you haven't felt in a while. Go there. Let God have his way. God bless you guys.